BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. Well, thank you, Mr. Morris, and good to have you with us on Crosstalk today. We have uh, an interesting program, as they always are, but t- today a good friend, good friend of uh, the church, a good friend of your family as well, <clears throat> a man who came out of radicalized terrorism, willing to die for the cause of jihad until he was converted to Christianity in 1994. As a member of the PLO, he was involved in terror activity and was imprisoned for a time in Jerusalem. He recruited uh, to plant a bomb in Bethlehem. His mother was an American, his father a Palestinian Arab. He was sent to the United States to study in 1978 and was recruited at a terror conference. He was active for a time with the Muslim Brotherhood in the States. His life was changed when he met Christ, turning from being a hater of Israel to a follower of Jesus. And today, welcome, Waleed Shabbat. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good to have you, and uh, we thank God for your testimony, and uh, I will never forget the first time I heard you down there in that winter night at the University of Wisconsin, where uh, you had people, we all went through metal detectors, and uh, you had some good reason to do that at that time. That's correct. We had Islamists uh, and Palestinians and pro-terrorism who are cursing at me, just as we've seen a few days ago where Christians showed a presence in Dearborn, Michigan, and they were stoned, mm. and they were cursed at with urine thrown at them. It was, it was quite pathetic. Uh, so this is the kind of thing, as Christians, we need to endure to show the truth of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, one of the police officers, in fact, that uh, showed no interest in helping the Christians in Dearborn, mm. Michigan, uh, was featured in the All American Muslim, uh, and uh, very few people picked up on this. In fact, I'm doing an article on it to expose how even they infiltrated our police mechanism on the White House, the government, uh, the State Department. This is an issue, a very crucial issue that we need to be basically focus on in America to preserve this country, not to go through the way of Europe. And we've seen how what happened in Europe, and of course with the Arab Spring now uh, turning to an Islamist winter, mm. uh, we need to be more crucial because it's it's more crucial because now mm. they're gaining the confidence level that I've been talking about years ago. Well, it, uh, it, you know the, the the fallout of the election. Of course, everybody's talking about this. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which continues with some of the interesting ties to the United States Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton. Uh, This is an interesting development. Uh, Can you share something about that? Well, yes, of course. I mean, Saleh Abedin is the mother of Huma Abedin. Huma Abedin is with Hillary Clinton 24-7, and she's in the State Department. Now, many will think, well, because her mother, Saleh Abedin, that's Anthony Weiner's wife, whom I be deemed being related, it's guilt by association. But our laws uh, are of such that there is guilt by association when it comes to government officials working in the government. In other words, your associates is crucial to establish whether you, have, you are eligible, eligible to work for the government, especially when whom I be deemed creates uh, events in which she introduces Hillary Clinton to speak Dar al-Hikmah, which uh, her mother, Saleh Abedin, who is a member of the Sisterhood organization, is dean of the of the college in Saudi Arabia, as well as her brother, uh, Hassan Abedin. He is, uh, sits on the board with Yusuf al-Qaradawi and Omar Nasif, who was the godfather of al-Qaeda. In fact, it's very rare that I've even uh, shared the information uh, from the Arabic language, which is going to be in my book, but for the sake of your show, we'll share some of it, uh, in, in which Saleh Abedin, uh, the mother of Huma Abedin, uh, was very much intertwined with many movements that call for jihad. And, uh, in fact, the link of the family of the Abedin goes way back to the Hitler movement and Nazism when the Muslim Brotherhood collaborated with the Nazis 
uh, to annihilate the Jewish people. Uh, the most intriguing uh, member of the sisterhood organization is Salih Abedin, the mother of Huma Abedin, uh, which uh, in uh, Al Medina uh, uh, newspaper, the history of Abedin mm. name stems from uh, uh, the son of Hussein, son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the nephew of the Prophet of Islam. And it goes down to the Hajj Amini, Amin al-Husseini collaboration with Nazism. Mm. Uh, and Salih Abedin's name appears on the main Al-Azhar University website uh, as a member of the High Council of Islamic Matters. Remember, the founder of Al-Qaeda, Abdullah Azzam, is a graduate of Al-Azhar. So it's very much interconnected with the, uh, many of these organizations, like the OIC, mm-hmm. MWL's financial arm of the United States, Rabita Trust, which was considered a financial arm for terrorism, Saleh Abedin is a member of that organization, which makes her part of MWL. Uh, and uh, the financial history for support of terrorist group, an organizational link to them, including Hamas and Abu Sayyaf group, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, Jama'at al-Islamiyya, mm-hmm. and Al-Qaeda as well. well you know, uh, these are very mm-hmm. serious issues. Now, uh, Waleed, we've heard a lot about the Muslim Brotherhood. That was, I mean, we've been that's been top top uh, tier there. But the sisterhood thing, uh, you know, who is this group and what is their agenda? Getting close to it. Well, the agenda of the sisterhood is as declared by the Muslim Brotherhood is to be an arm of the Muslim Brotherhood for creating. Uh, influence in the United Nations, State Department, the government, Washington, the White House, in which the 63 members are very educated from doctors to media moguls to conspiracy theorists uh, that uh, calls for supposedly women's rights while they try to defend, in fact, one of the colleagues of Saleh Abedin defended the rights of husbands to rape their wives, marital rape in Islam is permissible. And uh, so they try to become a a fifth column, and they call themselves as such, a fifth column, infiltrating governments and twisting the arms of government officials to make the West Sharia compliant. So they are the major arm. Uh, In fact, uh, the West is oblivious, really, to the role of women in Islam in trying to uh, uh, catapult the agenda of the Islamist movement, as we've seen the success now with Mm -hmm. Mohammed Mursi winning the election. (laughs) in which his wife is also a member of the sisterhood, and she is a colleague of Salih Abedin, the mother of Huma Abedin. Of course, Mohammed Mursi, the current uh, president of Egypt now, you know, he has said, made statements before in the past saying that anyone who believes in the Trinity has uh, low mental faculty, something's wrong with them. Exactly what we've seen in Nazism. Sure. Um, as anybody who visits the ruins in Egypt is visiting idols, uh, Western dress should be prohibited in Egypt. So we're going to see Egypt catapult into uh, the Middle Ages fairly soon, uh, as we see the whole thing uh, unfolds in front of our mm-hmm. eyes, and which I've spoken in your program before sure. on this issue, predicting the coming of the Muslim Brotherhood, predicting their victory, predicting yep. the uh, Arab Spring turning into an Islamist Spring. In fact, I was watching... Rashad al Ghanoushi yesterday in Arabic, which I'm interpreting in English, uh, in which he made remarks in the past that he was not for the caliphate, he is for secularism. Now what's he saying? It's the path to Jerusalem, it's the path to the yep. caliphate. So they are of one mind. And the story is the story of Jerusalem. We have to always remember this. I always focus on Zechariah, not on CNN. Zechariah the prophet you know, he said Jerusalem will become a trembling cup to all surrounding nations. And we see this happening right in front of our eyes. Now, um, uh, I yeah. had a question here, Wally. The, you know, this uh, deputy chief of staff for Hillary, that's Huma Abedin. Has, yeah. has she ever been vetted, really? I mean, has anybody checked her out uh, from that standpoint, or is it just a carte blanche acceptance? Well, uh, we don't know the vetting process with, with Huma Abedin's special case. Yeah. Uh, however, uh, Bachman, as well as even uh, media moguls, have been using the material we're talking about to bring the issue of the vetting process. So no one knows whether, whether she was vetted or not, but the information 
that we circulated is very clear. Even Rush Limbaugh spoke about it yesterday on his radio show. So we're always happy to introduce to the American government and the American people the reality of what is being done from behind the scene by the Islamic Muslim Brothers. In fact, you have just last week, you had uh, one of the parliament of Egypt who was a terrorist, and he openly uh, announced his support for Islamic Jihad, welcomed into the United States. Uh, welcome to speak to uh, our government officials and do their bidding. So uh, we've seen Sundus also, whose her mother is a member of the Sisterhood organization, uh, come to the United States. And so now they're opening the borders for the Muslim Brotherhood to come to our media and the, the White House and all these things to uh, begin to uh, gain support for the agenda. It's no secret that the American government now sub- openly supports uh, what happened in Egypt, and when the military in Egypt tries to stop this tyranny from gaining power, uh, our government goes against the mm. military of Egypt. Yeah. You know, uh, so unfortunately, uh, we are really in bed with the Islamist movement. We are in bed with the terrorists, and the war on terror, as I always say, my foot. Anthony Weiner is Jewish, if I understand correctly. Uh, and and he's married to uh, Huma Abedin. That's correct. Uh, isn't it against the law for uh, Islamic law, Sharia, for a Muslim to marry a Jew? Yes, the punishment is death by stoning. So uh, you had even one uh, uh, Sharia institute in Kuwait uh, saying that her marriage to Anthony Weiner was illegal. <laughs> Yet you have. The head of the Muslim Brotherhood, the liaison of the Muslim Brotherhood, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi, he had no problem with her marriage. The question is why? Because under the uh, law of Muruna, M-U-R-U-N-A, mm-hmm. look it up. Every American should understand what's going on. Under Muruna law, the Muslim um, can break every single prohibition in Islam. In fact, Mur- the definition of Muruna is sanctioning prohibitions. So how, how can we sanction uh, the prohibitions in the, tenth, in, in the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not kill, now you can kill. Uh, you know, thou shalt not marry in Islam, thou shalt not uh, marry a non-Muslim for a woman. No, she can marry a Muslim because now she has the ears of Hillary Clinton. Now she can influence Hillary, Hillary Clinton. You know, uh, uh, so it is illegal uh, in the Muslim Brotherhood. And this is widespread in the Arabic Muslim world. They openly talk about Moruna and the injunctions of Moruna. Um, and uh, this is the status quo uh, in Egypt. They played the Moruna prior to the Arab Spring. And now that the Arab Spring won victoriously, uh, now uh, we see the full picture that, uh, you know, uh, you can openly say what you have to say. You can condemn Israel. You can uh, denounce peace treaties. You can... Uh, so we're going to see the future, and the future will show us. And the American people will wake up, unfortunately, until it's too late. With us today, Waleed Shubat, a man who lived a life of terror but came to Christ and has a totally different attitude toward Israel. He loves Israel. We'll be right back in just 60 seconds. This is Crosstalk. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist and president of the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, are engineering principles ever used by living things? Yes, they are, Chris. Here's one. In engineering, we study about crack propagation techniques where a point of weakness becomes the crack which continues to grow. A particular worm seems to know about this and uses it. This worm lives in the mud at the bottom of the sea. It gets its nutrition from the mud by employing this technique. The worm is able to widen cracks in the mud by sticking his head in a tiny hole and then turning himself inside out, widening the crack. He then goes inside the crack and the process continues. Think of the impossibility of evolution teaching this worm to do this and then the properties to allow it to turn itself inside out. God designed the animals to do remarkable things. The chief engineer designed all this back in Genesis. For more information, you can find us on the web at www.icr.org.
And welcome back to Crosstalk, where today we're talking with Waleed Shubat, a man who uh, understands what terrorism is all about because he was part of it, but uh, willing to die for the cause of jihad until he found God's answer. And uh, as we're talking about this, many of us are aware of this election thing in Egypt. And, of course, uh, everybody, uh, Waleed, everybody was uh, claiming that, well, it might turn out uh, differently. It might be that uh, uh, it won't be the Muslim Brotherhood that gets in. When I heard that, I thought, somebody's joking. This thing looks like a a put-up job, if you please. Yes. uh, In fact, the ones who are basically pulling the uh, covering with the scales on the American people is the American government itself. Mm. The American government is very liberal. So Mm. Americans ask, is it naivete or or is it something else? Well, it's not naivete that a revolutionary government of the United States of America, socialists, are revolutionaries, period. We have to understand there's a socialist agenda and there is a revolutionary agenda. Al Gore is revolutionary. He, he has an agenda. He complements the Islamist movement. He complements the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, I did an investigation on the quotes that he uses, uh, that Al Gore uses, and I uh, linked them to Omar Nasif, one of the godfathers of Al-Qaeda, who talks about environmentalism to basically seek acceptance by the American revolutionary movement. Omar Nasif is also a friend of the Abidine. He was also uh, with uh, the Abidines when they made, uh, the, the, they made a movement for the minority affairs uh, and so on and so forth, which Huma Abidine also was a member. In fact, Huma Abidine is not guilt by association, but she was a member of this movement. In fact, we even uh, got a screenshot uh, thanks to the anti-Mullah blog I've got a green sh- screenshot of her membership in that movement, of Huma Abedin's membership of that movement. So they collaborate together. You know, they, it's the collaboration between the American revolutions, revolutionaries of the liberal movement and the Islamic movement is not naivete, but it is agreement, because they agree on much of the issues. They agree that the earth uh, was a, in a big bang. Big bang is not foreign to Islamic mm-hmm. dogma. Uh, abortion issues, you know, life doesn't begin at the moment of conception in Islam. Uh, the rights of animals, that uh, all these animal rights movements, all these agendas are very much in uh, line with the liberal movement that is governing our country currently. This is why it's crucial for Americans to do the right thing in the coming election. Mm. We have to change this regime, we have to change the system, or else uh, what, we don't, what we're seeing in the Arabic world is going to come and haunt us in our backyard. Let me ask a question now regarding, uh, I mean, Hillary Clinton and the president seemingly just not impressed, not worried, just coasting along uh, with some of the stuff that's happening in Egypt and, and also the threat of Islamic terrorists. Do you believe that uh, the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, and the president, Barack Obama, are just ignorant of these matters, or do you believe that it's willful, that it's intentional? Absolutely willful and absolutely intentional. Obama's attack on the Bible and the biblical principles, everybody can view on YouTube. You can see him you know, uh, condemning the Bible, saying that the Bible supports slavery, the Bible is anti-women, so on and so forth. His attack is against the Bible. He has never once critiqued or even criticized the Qur'an, not once. So uh, this whole facade of his conversion to Christianity is simply a ruse. Uh, you know, Obama, uh, in fact, I reviewed, uh, interviewed one of his first cousins in Arabic language, Al Jazeera. He's very clear, supports his family, supports uh, many things that goes on in the Middle East. Um, he was involved in, his, in, in Kenya, uh, in uh, uh, forwarding uh, one of the Islamists, uh, you know, he is very much in bed with the whole thing. In fact, it was President Obama's appearance in Egypt, insisting that the Muslim Brotherhood would be present in his speech, uh, that gave the legality for the Muslim Brotherhood to say we have a small, short window that we need to start a revolution. And when the Muslim Brotherhood was considered a terror organization in Egypt, it wasn't considered a terrorist organization in the State Department. Only Al-Qaeda uh, was considered, and others was con- were considered terrorist organization, Islamic Jihad, so on and so forth. 
But the mother of all these organizations is the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm-hmm. So Americans need to understand the game of good cop versus bad cop. The bad cop will carry out the terrorism, the violence, uh, the extremism. Well, the good cop says, we have nothing to do with this. In fact, we condemn it. Yet in the Arabic language, they support it fully. Mm. Uh, so there's not much translation the CIA is doing. In fact, why am I? And this is the question I always ask. Why am I the only one in this country that's translating all this material? It's volumes of material that should have been interpreted and translated by the CIA, by the State Department, to make the American people aware of this movement. Yet I'm, I'm, I feel like a lone ranger in this, in this matter, just mm-hmm. as you are. Well, you know, as you share, and I know that God has opened the door for you to share with uh, people in law enforcement, uh, are those doors still open? Are there still courageous uh, law enforcement groups that invite you in? Uh, on the contrary, uh, the law enforcement group uh, in America, even, even I try to get help from some law enforcement groups that were very supportive, uh, it was very difficult because they are basically commanded by the upper echelons yep. to stay away from the Islamophobes. So how often do you see the Islamophobes on Fox News even? Yep. Uh, where are the days that you see uh, uh, you know, individuals that used to be critic, uh, critiques of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood yep. and the movement? Well, on the mainstream media. Well, you know, even so, even Greta Van Susteren uh, was about, somebody was going to bring that up on the program, and she cut him off, and she said, uh, no, we're not going to go there. There you go. Yeah. Last time I was in Fox News, it was David Asman. It was during the Arab Spring. And, you know, they split the screen in half. Yep. And basically I was saying, don't believe the guy in the other half of the screen. This is not a Arab Spring. It's an Islamist winter. And I was attacked by David Asman on Fox News. And that's the last time I recall I appeared on Fox News. Of course, the story of Huma Abedin is gaining momentum. Yeah. They, they don't use us because they love us. They use us because they have no choice. Sometimes a piece of news is only comes from us, from our, from our sources, from what we're doing here in America. Waleed, there is a call for Jerusalem to become the capital of the United States of the Arabs, the caliphate. Comment yeah. on this. Comment on this. Yes. In fact, in every single revolution in the Arab Spring, whether it's Tunisia, whether it's Libya, whether it's Egypt, whether it's Ghanoushi in uh, Tunisia or uh, Mohammed Morsi of Egypt, they're calling for Jerusalem in every event. I have events galore to show people what they're saying to Jerusalem. We march martyrs by the millions. They want to establish an Islamic caliphate, and the central headquarters of the Islamic caliphate will fulfill their desire to establish their eschatological view, and that is to establish an Islamic Messiah in Jerusalem, capital in Jerusalem. And, of course, our Bible tells us about the one that comes to the Temple Mount, Mm. and he sits in the Temple of God, declaring himself to be God, is none other than, I I believe, is this Islamic Mahdi, which they're calling for. In fact, I was reviewing a news clip in Dearborn, which shows in Dearborn banners that talks about the Mahdi. They even have celebrations, festivities in Dearborn, Michigan hailing the ushering of the Islamic Mahdi. And by the way, this is not only a Shia concept. It's a Sunni concept and Shia concept. The OIC, Organization of Islamic Council, have declared emphatically that any Muslim who doesn't believe in the Islamic Messiah, i.e. the Mahdi, is no longer a Muslim. So the Mahdist movement is not just the Shia of Iran or Ahmad al-Nijad with the 12th Imam. It is the call of every Muslim mandated by Islam to give allegiance to the Mahdi when he comes. In fact, even Erdogan visited of Turkey, visited Libya, visited Somalia, visited um, uh, Egypt, and he was hailed as the uh, coming Khalifa. The coming, you know, in other words, this Khalifa of Islam is the Mahdi himself. We have to understand Islamic eschatology. The Khalifa in the end days, which is these days, and according to the Islamist, is the Mahdi himself. He's the one who brings seven years peace after havoc, they're creating the havoc, so, this, uh, so they can usher this Islamic Mahdi. This mm. is happening, yeah. bro- Brother Keith, this is happening in front of our very eyes. Look at Egypt. There will be a civil revolution in Egypt, and there will be civil war in Egypt. Yeah. Um, Egypt is, is, is a very detrimental issue. Uh, you have a one, one, one hundred, over a hundred missiles, air, uh, land-to-land missiles, uh, uh, captured going from Libya to Egypt. In other words, the weapons that were used in the revolution in Libya are going to go to Egypt. For what? In case the military of Egypt 
tries to succumb over the Muslim Brotherhood, there will be a revolution, civil war. And what did Isaiah 19 tell us? You know, I will have Egyptian fight against Egyptian. Egyptian people will be giving to a perverse spirit. Wow, those words from the Bible, those words from the book of Isaiah opened my mind years ago to see what is happening when I began to write about it. Fifteen years ago, no one was listening. I didn't, I wasn't no genius. I simply read the Bible. The news media is in the Bible. It is not that God forgot to tell us the status quo. We forgot to see what God has been saying for 2,000 years. Waleed, as we listen today and every time we share with you, I know that there is a a challenge to each and every one of us as believers, as what we need to pray and we need to stand firm on God's Word. What what can we do in our involvement in our communities? Well, we each have to basically see the surrounding, what we, what we see. God puts us in situations where He has us view and witness what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. You know, if there is a fire in an apartment complex, would you stand by watching people die? Or would you risk your life? The beauty of the Bible is that we risk our lives for the rescuing of other lives. So it's, it's no love that I love my children. The love that the Bible taught me is to love your children and your grandchildren and America's children and everybody else's children to save this nation. So we have an agenda that we need to fight. Is, you know, we need to understand that nationalism and to preserve a, a nation is biblical, that uh, the Bible have aspired nationalism. What we, what, what's happening in the Muslim world? They want to destroy all nationalism. They want to create one nation, that is the Islamic Ummah, as they call it, an Islamic nation in which everybody must count out to Sharia Islam, to changing the laws, to changing our constitution. Americans must begin to stand up and say no Sharia in Islam, no to Sharia, no to attempting to change our constitution. This is part of the Antichrist movement. We are going to be opening our phone lines as soon as we come back from the break, folks. But I'm going to open them now if you'd like to get online, because many of you would have uh, questions for Waleed, maybe some opinions or thoughts. Keep them brief and to the point. Our telephone number is 800-733-9829. Anywhere on the planet, it's toll-free, 800-733-9829. And uh, we would welcome your calls if you'd like to get online now. We will look forward to your calls. Waleed, uh, before we go to the break, I know you have points of contact which many people need to know about. Would you take a moment and share that? Yes, I mean, people can access what we do uh, in shubat.com. It's easy to uh, spell as you spell the word shu, S H O E, and the word bat, B A T. One word, S H O E B A T dot com, and begin to educate ourselves on really what is happening. We're up to date. We always update our material, and we have tremendous amount of material for people to begin to educate themselves on the danger of the Islamic movement. We look forward to talking to you on the other side of the break, which is about a minute from now. Our phone lines, by the way, are jammed. Every phone line is jammed, and we'll be right back. This is Crosstalk on the VCY America Radio Network. There are three major events that changed history forever. They are creation, the fall, and the flood. These, combined with the promise of Christ, are all rooted in the book of Genesis. Yet many in the church are treating these cornerstones of the Christian faith as allegory, which only sows confusion and undermines faith in the accuracy of the Bible itself. In the book, The Big Three, Dr. Henry Morris III reveals how the scriptures negate the concept of theistic evolution, why a living faith and a saving faith exemplify a solid belief in a special creation, and the connection between the creation, the fall of man, and the flood, and how these pivotal events led to Christ, and eventually the cross. The book is a call to return to a confident trust in God's Word. To obtain your copy of The Big Three, send a donation of $13 or more to VCY America, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. To donate by phone, call 1-800-729-9829. That's 1-800-729-9829.
And we have phone calls coming in from all over the country, and we are welcoming your calls. Waleed Shubat, our guest today, a man who came out of a life of terror, a man who was determined to uh, literally wreak terror and follow the Islamic teachings of jihad, which is holy war. But as we see the folly of this and as we see the bloodshed and look across our the world today and what's happening in other countries, we study the meanings of Sharia law, which is absolutely horrendous. Uh, and there are those today, yes, even in, in, in places of high-ranking uh, judicial positions that are literally regarding whether or not Sharia law might be a great option for our country. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the inmates have taken over the asylum again. And we need to be very, very careful as we see society being swept along many times with things that they know nothing about. Uh, Waleed, there have been others. Our, our good friend Usama Dakdok says that 80 percent of the Islamics have never even read the Quran. Well, yes, because, you know, the majority of Muslims in the world are non-speak Arab speaking. Yeah. Um, Arabic language is mandated by all Muslims to go to heaven. You can't <laughs> right. worship Allah in Islam unless you speak the Arabic language. The question is why. Uh, well, the reason is because we have to understand all the isms of the world, specifically in this case Islam, wants yeah. to undo what happened in Genesis. Yeah. When we study the Bible, we got to start in Genesis, not a Revelation to understand the prophetic word that Islamist movement today insists on one language, one world government, no nationalism. In fact, Islam is anti-nationalism. Mm. It hates nationalism. You look at Tunisia, they removed the, the Tunisian flag. They began to host the Islamic flag for all the world. So we need to understand this, you know, that uh, majority Muslims don't really mm. understand the Quran or even read the Quran. Um, the Arabic language is a foreign language to many Muslims, Indonesia, Turkey, Iran. You know, this is why from the non-Arab speaking Islamic countries, we find the greatest oh. influx towards Christianity, right. because they begin to see it, yes. We have calls coming in now, and we're going to go first of all to Monroe, Wisconsin. Kathy, you're on the air with Wally Chubak. Go right ahead. Hi. Yeah, I don't understand where are all these uh, women's groups. You know, they're always talking about their rights. And here in Sharia law, you know, if a man wants to cut a woman's tongue out, they can. They can beat up. They get, you know, if they ask for a divorce, they can get beheaded like that lady out in, out east. And I mean, and if there's a rape situation, you have to have uh, witnesses of what? Three or four well, I mean, men. I mean, it's it's just horrible. So where are uh, the women? You know, why aren't why aren't we hearing it in the in the media? Uh, ask not what the women's uh, uh, groups are doing in America, but ask what is the church doing in America. Mm. Uh, of course, women's liberation groups in America are not for women's liberation. They're about the killing the unborn. Uh, animal groups, PETA. PETA is not about saving animals. They have more killing of animals under PETA than your local pound. So these movements are basically a face. We have to understand this. A face in defending so-called the women's rights movement, yet the Bible itself is the greatest defense for women's rights movement. Uh, it was uh, Christians who stopped the process of killing women in India. Sati, women used to get burned in India. Who objected? The Christians, uh, the uh, you know the British who were occupied uh, India, brought civilization to India. Mm. So while we condemn the British occupation of India, we never look at the good things. Uh, what uh, look at America, our own country? You know, uh, you talk about the Indians and the and the, and the, and the road to the, of tears and all these things. But let's study the Indian history, the, the American Indian, the American Native Americans were basically uh, scalping people and all kinds of mess, plucking hearts, and, you know, uh, we brought civilization. Christianity is the one that is the bringer of all civilization to the world. And it was under, yes, uh, you know, so we have to understand, you know, uh, sure, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly behind everything. Uh, we made mistakes. Uh, everybody makes mistakes. Uh, but we have to look at the good in this case, in which we have to understand that this, the women lib movement is, is not about protecting women. It's about the unprotection of the unborn. Let's go to Sam in Pensacola, Florida. Sam, you're on the air with Wally Shubat. Uh, yes, thank you. Now, my first question, uh, Mr. Shubak, is would you give a definition of a good Muslim? 
That's a good question. Uh, a good Muslim is the one who follows the Quran and the Sharia, uh, the Islamic law, as de- mandated by Islam, by the Quran itself. So uh, Osama bin Laden is a very good Muslim. Uh, so uh, you have Muslims who, well, their birth certificate says Muslims. See, this is the part that the West doesn't understand. That in the Middle East, in the Muslim world, it's what your birth certificate says. says. If it says Muslim, then you are Muslim, even though you don't like Islam. You don't. So you have uh, people with liberal thought or don't care about Islamic Sharia. These are not peaceful because of Islam. They're peaceful despite of Islam. Why, then, in our country, do we talk of good Muslims? Are there any such things that are not a threat to the United States of America? All good Muslims should be a threat, then. Well, yes. I mean, uh, all uh, Muslims who follow Sharia should be a threat. This is the question I asked an imam who says, I'm a peaceful Muslim. I was doing a lecture in Barbados, and he says, I believe in liberty, all these things, and, you know, pull the ruse. And I got to the podium with one minute. I says, are you willing to denounce Sharia law right here and right now? Yes or no? Yes or no? And he says, of course not. I said, then you are a good Muslim. You are not peaceful because you are a good Muslim and you abide with Sharia. Thank you for having me. I flew all the way to Barbados just to ask a question. This is why Christians need to know how to ask questions. Jesus, our Messiah, knew how to ask questions. If you look at the questions Jesus asked in the New Testament, it was a checkmate. You either confessed that you were an error or you looked like a fool. So we have to basically learn how to ask questions. Despite even the Sharia laws that call, calls for the amputation of hands and limbs, let's talk about the civil laws. Can a Muslim woman inherit the same uh, as the Muslim male counterpart? The answer is no. So even under the civil code of Islam, if a woman cannot inherit equal to the man if her parents, if her parents died, we should conclude that this is subservient not even come close to our Constitution. This is why, as Christians, we have to believe in the absolute. The problem with the Church in America is that it doesn't really stand up with absolutes. We must say that the Constitution of the United States of America is absolutely superior, not better, superior. Because if you say better, that means Sharia is good. Sharia is no good. Sharia is what is really enslaves women, it's, it, it treats minorities as Christians, as infidels. It's the reason why most Christians in history have been butchered to death. Very but, few in America talk about the butchery of the Islamic movement hmm. historically against Christians, way much more than the Roman Empire can even imagine or dream of doing. Waleed, we have another caller coming in. In fact, uh, we have uh, more calls coming in. And folks, uh, hit your question, and we'll get right to it there. Our telephone number, 800-733-9829, anywhere on the planet, 800-733-9829. Jonathan is standing by in Warsaw, Indiana. Jonathan, you're on the air with Waleed. Yeah, I had two questions. One question, will the uh, Antichrist come from the Islamic movement? And two, will the Christians have to worry about where he comes from? Okay. Yes, Christians have to worry where the Antichrist comes from, because in America, most Christians think he's coming from the West. So as we were focused on the West, we were focused on the European Union, we were focused on the Catholic Church, so on and so forth. Yet there's nowhere in the Bible that talks about a threat coming from the West, even if you look at the state of Israel. In the Bible, it's coming from the North, from the East, from the South, nothing from the West. Yet we're focused so much on the West. We have to look at the literals in the Bible. All the literal references in the Bible in which the Messiah, Christ, fights, they're all Islamic. How often have you had in your Sunday school a teacher talk about Zechariah chapter 9, in which the Messiah will go fight Greece, Ionia. Ionia is in Asia Minor. That's not in the West. That's in the North. Uh, He will go with the whirlwinds of the South. The Messiah comes from the South. Where is he going? He's going North. Habakkuk 3, the Messiah fights Midian. Midian is the brother of Ishmael, the Arab world. Uh, The Messiah in Isaiah 10, he fights Lebanon. Even in the judgment of the nations, there's the Messiah fighting against who? Uh, He's fighting against Tyre, Lebanon. 
uh, he's fighting against uh, Kush, Sudan, Somalia, the hub of Islamic movements, Egypt, Isaiah 19, the, the Lord comes riding in a swift cloud and is coming into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter before him. Wow! He is the Messiah fighting in Egypt. If you ask a Western Christian, what do you know about the Messiah's coming when he lands on earth? They only will tell you about him landing on the Mount of Olives. Yet, let's take a look at Zechariah. The Messiah fights the surrounding nations. They're all Islamic. Uh, the Antichrist, he divides, he, what does he want to do? He wants to basically change set times and set laws. What does the Islamist movement want to change our constitution and every constitution on earth? Where is this happening in the European Union, which is bankrupt? So we need to begin to understand the literal parts of the Bible, apply those to Revelation, then we will get the full picture, and not vice versa. Okay, we're going to go to Pensacola, Florida, and uh, Benjamin, and we do have some open lines, folks. If you want to call with your questions or comments, 800-733-9829, 800-733-9829. Benjamin in Pensacola, you are on the air. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, Wally. Uh, follow up to the question that was asked: Were there any good Muslims? Uh, I'm asking. If, uh, my neighbor just moved in uh, yesterday, and I noticed that his fence need repair and his privacy fence. And I said I'd be glad to help you with that. And immediately he apologized to me, says if my music gets too loud, you just let me know. And I says, Oh, I'm a musician too. And I says I play at church, and I'm a trombonist. And he, I says. Uh, would you like to join me? He says, I play the trumpet player. I'm a jazz player, but I'm Jewish, and they don't allow that in the synagogue. So, so for some reason, I was led to witness to it. But I said, uh, do you believe in Jesus? He says, I do not. I'm Jewish. And he says, this is very complicated. And he opened the door and went inside his house. And I would like to ask if it's proper to do this, if that person that wrote the book, on Islamic tsunami that I listened to, and also you, if it's not personal, could I ask you if you're a believer in Jesus? And I will hang up. Is that is that proper to ask a Jewish person that? And would you have, would you want me to answer now, or should I hang up? Could, could, could you answer the question now, please, for me? Uh, is it proper to ask a Jew if they believe in Jesus? It's yeah. proper to ask everyone if they believe in Jesus. Mm-hmm. Why just the Jew? Why not ask the Gentile, ask the Hindu, ask the Mormon, ask... You know, do they truly believe in the Messiah who rose from the dead? You asked if I was a Christian, what do you think I am? Mm. <laughs> right. a, a, a Buddhist? Of course I'm a Christian. What have you been listening to the last, to this show? Uh, I've been quoting the Bible, you know, uh, and I've been talking about defending this country. Of course I believe in the Son of the Living God. And this is why I object on, on Muslims who say we believe in Jesus. Sometimes we say, well, the Jew doesn't believe in Jesus, but the Muslim does, so the Muslim is better for us. Well, yes, the Jew denies that Jesus is the Messiah, but the Muslim tells you he believes in the Messiah that is not the Son of the living God. That's more crucial. Uh, He denies the Trinity. He is anti-Christianity. Well, the Jew says, just leave me alone. We're going to be right back with uh, Wally Chubat in 60 seconds. This is Crosstalk. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website is worldviewweekend.com. Today, we look at number 15 on our list of 20 characteristics of false teachers. Number 15 is false teachers cause personal and doctrinal division within the church. Romans 16, verse 17 speaks to this. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to doctrine, which you learned, and avoid them. So indeed, False teachers cause personal and doctrinal division within the church. Jude 19. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. You know what? It's okay to have divisions when it's us standing on God's word. 1 Corinthians 11, 18. There must be divisions among you to know who is approved of God. Yes, false teachers cause division. And when we stand against false teachers, we sometimes cause division because we're standing on the truth of God's word. And that is okay. It's okay to cause division when you're standing for biblical truth.
And welcome back to Crosstalk as we are visiting today with Waleed Shubat, a man who was saved out of a life of terror to a life that uh, follows the Lord Jesus. And we're very grateful to have him on the air today. One of the, we do have some open lines if you'd like to place a call. I see one uh, call coming in right now. But Wally, I wonder if you would share about some of the books that you have written and also some of the writings that your son, who I know is uh, very much involved in the ministry as well. Well, uh, the last book I did was For God or for Tyranny When Nations Abandon the, God, the, the, the Laws of God. And that's, I collaborated with my son, Theodore Schubat. People can get it from Schubat.com, S-H-O-E-B-A-T.com. Uh, if people are interested in our prophetic teaching, we have several series, which people can buy as a package, several hours of information and teaching on, uh, uh, on, the, in the, in the, on prophecy, Islam prophecy, and the Bible. Uh, and also my book, God's War and Terror which is uh, a volume of information in comparing Islamic eschatology with the biblical eschatology and the proper way of looking at hermeneutics. People can get these on shubat.com, S-H-O-E-B-A-T dot com. And uh, if uh, there are those who would like to raise questions, you have an email address where they can send you questions or any comments? It's very simple. You know, people can go to the website, and there's a way to click these days on email, send an email, or they can write us at walid at shubat.com. Just, that's walid, W-A-L-I-D, mm-hmm. at sign, shubat, S-H-O-E-B-A-T dot com. Walid at shubat dot com. Okay, well, we have James online from Cleveland, Ohio, and James, you are on the air with Walid. Hi, Walid. Uh, Hi. James, uh, turn your radio down. I can hear it in the background, so please, there's a seven-second oh. delay, so if you can keep that down, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, Waleed, I want to see uh, about these Muslims. Uh, the radio's got to go all the way off, okay? Okay, sorry. Okay, your question. Yeah, about these, uh, Waleed, where you are from? Which part? I'm the from Middle Bethlehem, East. Israel. From Israel. From Bethlehem, yes. Bethlehem, Israel, yes. Bethlehem. So you're, you're not Jew, you're Muslim, right? No, I'm Christian. What's your question? You're a Christian now. You were, uh, used to be a Muslim? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, James, uh, we do have rules here, and whatever it is, you keep the radio playing, and it causes some real technical problems, so I'm going to have to af- uh, ask you to... Uh, discontinue the call. We do have some rules here, and I don't want to be rude, but uh, James, if you are going to be on the air, you must turn off the radio because there's at least a seven-second delay, and that does cause confusion. I'm awfully sorry to to terminate the call, but uh, we are having technical difficulties there. One of the things, again, folks, uh, and, and Wally, do you see this in our society today, that there are people that define Christianity uh simply that they are cultural Christians, meaning that uh, they don't have a bone in their nose or uh, ivory plugs in their ears. Uh, they don't, they're, not, they're not cannibals, or they don't do weird and uh, native things. But from the standpoint of being a real Christian, born again by the Spirit of God, uh, I was talking to one day to a young uh, Jewish attorney, and uh, he, w- he was saying this, that the born-again Christian is the best friend that Israel has. And uh, so I, I asked him, I said, now, that, I, I believe that too. But I said, uh, where, did you, where do you think that born, term born-again came from? And uh, he said, well, I think Jerry Falwell came up with that. And, <laughs> and, and, and I, I said, no, I said, it was a young Jewish man. Really? He said, yes. His name was Jesus from Nazareth. And uh, I think a lot of people, uh, this issue of being truly spirit-born uh, of God, it's not just that we we follow the Ten Commandments or we, we follow a bunch of uh, pharisaical rules, but being a real Christian uh, is, is more than this cultural Christianity that we bandied about today. Right. In fact, even cultural Christians you know, live in a, such a great country as the United States of America. I need to understand 
that the reason there is civilization was because of Christianity, mm-hmm. because people think that we can have civilization without Christianity. Mm-hmm. There isn't a single country on earth, historically speaking, or even currently, that has civilization, as we understand it in the West, that has uh, uh, basically no Christian influence. All of them have Christian influence. So we're living on the leftovers, the residue, if you will, of what our forefathers did in this country. So we need to appreciate what these people have done, our Constitution. It wasn't created by some liberal. It was created by Christians. So, you know, people need to understand that this civilization and the civilization of the West is a Christian civilization. This country had heart pluckers in it before, mm. scalpels, all these things. It was, you know, in fact, all the civilizations in the past have practiced, uh, you know, uh, human sacrifice, mm-hmm. whether you look at the Greek, whether you look at the Roman, whether you look at the Islamic. The Islamic civilization today, why are they killing people? What's going on there? It's part of their cult. It's part of their religious indoctrination. It was Christianity that removed this cult of jihad, martyrdom, uh, when we occupied the Ottoman Empire. So now that the thing is reversed, the Ottoman Empire is coming back, or the Islamic Empire is gaining momentum, now we're going to see what it is like not to have Christian civilization in those countries. Waleed, I want to thank you for sharing today, and uh, I pray that God will continue to speak to your heart as you speak to a nation and uh, that uh, Christians will recognize that the influx of Islam and its godless teachings is something that requires that cr- true Christians would witness to the blood of Christ and to true salvation through Christ Jesus, because uh, that true Messiah is one I'm looking forward to seeing. And uh, folks, if you don't know Jesus personally as your personal Savior, uh, you're living on dangerous territory. And the coming of that Messiah, the Bible talks about him coming. And uh, when he comes back, he's coming for people who love him. Waleed, it's always a privilege to have you with us. And uh, God bless you. We pray for you and your son. God bless America. Amen. Thanks, Waleed. Bye-bye. And folks, thanks for joining us today on Crosstalk. We always welcome your calls. And if you have uh, questions, again, you heard the email addresses. Again, uh, plan to join us every day right here at this time. The program's called Crosstalk. to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from BCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Take Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208, or download by RSS or podcast from CrosstalkAmerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. Crosstalk.